Hi everyone, Mrs. Ortega here. I hope you're doing well and that um, you are moving right along with the in these videos with me. Uh, today we will take a look at our next chapter, which is chapter 7, where we will look and discover the evolution of vertebrate diversity. Uh, so all the animals we'll see in this chapter will be animals that have a backbone. Uh, so in our introduction here, it says that vertebrates have been evolving for half a billion years and that there are currently more than 60,000 vertebrate species, uh, which is a lot less than what we saw in our insects uh, where they had many, many thousands of species. And so as um, we look through this material, we'll see how scientists have pieced together different aspects of vertebrates using fossil evidence, genetic evidence, uh, morphology, the physical traits, uh, and developmental uh, homologies or similarities due to common ancestry um, among present day animals. And so here you can see the overall big ideas um, start out with vertebrate evolution and diversity, then moving to primates, and then lastly hominin evolution uh, where we look at uh, the development of the human species. And so let's start here, the vertebrate evolution diversity, um, where we will look at the um, major groups. And in terms of evolution, you're starting with the chordate group, which we saw last chapter had four um, traits. And so those four traits are... <clears throat> Uh, first of all, uh, it will be the notochord. Uh, that is the um, uh, structure that helps with a vertebral uh, backbone column. So it's kind of like the precursor to the backbone. Then you have the nerve cord, which is number two. That's dorsal and um, hollow. Then you have the pharyngeal slits. And these develop into the nose, ear, mouth region for humans. And then the post anal tail. Uh, so those four features are shared among all chordates. And so uh, looking at the evolution of chordates, you'll see in this next picture the groups that we'll look at today. Uh, so last chapter, we briefly looked at the lancelets and the tunicates, so the um, small marine animals that bury themselves, and then the sea squirts. And so in this chapter, we'll look at the vertebrates. Uh, where they have now developed that vert uh, vertebral column here. And so looking at this, our first two diverge are the hagfish and lampreys. And so we'll take a look at those and uh, we'll make our way down this uh, phylogenetic tree all the way down to mammals. And then for mammals, we'll look at primates and humans. Uh, so taking a look at our first um, organisms. They are both a, a marine or aquatic fish. Uh, the hackfish is one, the lampreys are another. Um, they both have a rudimentary vertebrae column um, and they have a notochord for support, um, so supporting that column as well as the nerve cord. Um, but they lack jaws and paired fins, so fins on each side. And so uh, you may be wondering, well, what's kind of the difference between these two? Uh, they sound awfully similar. Well, the hackfish are going to be a deep sea scavengers. So they're going to dwell on the bottom of the um, marine environment along that benthic zone and will use a slime for defense. Whereas lampreys are going to be parasites that will attach to sides of fish. 
Um, so let's take a look at that here. Uh, so here you can see a hagfish. Um, it has a very interesting um, mouth area in that so you can see there has little projections coming off of it uh, for detection. A very long um, body at the end of the body not shown here. It's a nice little uh, tail that acts as a fin as well to help move it as well, it does not have any side fins. Uh, you can see little holes along the sides of the body. Uh, these little holes or functioning in gas exchange along with uh, producing slime. Um, so that you can sell, see their slime glands. It produces this weird mucusy, clear slime in large amounts that helps it escape uh, not only predators, uh, but also um, in terms of it can use that to help itself get out of any scenario uh, with other hagfish as well. And so the other one is the lamprey here, and this one uh, can be in the marine or freshwater environment, and they have a, a very well-developed um, mouth region that, that has many circular teeth, or teeth in a circular form, along with teeth on its tongue to allow for it to attach on very tightly to a host and uh, feed on that host. Uh, most likely a larger fish. Um, and so both of these uh, have really awesome videos online and some of them uh, attached on the comments um, to this video. A video for each is about a, three minutes long. Um, it really shows you these unique creatures and how uh, interesting they are. And so I hope that you watch them. Um, just. Uh, brings um, some more in color to these two fish here. Um, in terms of um, the next vertebrates, they will develop jaws. Um, and so the jaw development is believed to have started from the, um, the bones that anchor the pharyngeal slits. And so that's shown here at that mouth region. Uh, so near, near the anterior region, there are skeletal rods, um, and then you can see as well gill slits. Um, so those had developed from the pharyngeal slits, and so they believe the skeletal rods closer towards the mouth developed into jaws. Um, while this is important, it's not something I ask you to memorize, so I've already put little X's on the bottom corner of these slides. Uh, so that brings us to the next group, which will have jaws. And so that um, here we have um, kind of three subdivisions. Uh, so the first one being conrichthians that are made up of sharks, rays, and skates. They are known for having a flexible skeleton that's ma mostly made up of cartilage. Um, and so that's its primary um, feature that you'll want to understand. There are several, many, many more features of each of these groups, but we'll focus on the biggest feature that this group has a skeleton that's mostly made out of cartilage, whereas the ray finned fishes uh, will have a skeleton made entirely out of bone. Uh, so bones hooked together. And then the last group here, the lobe fin fishes, uh, they have just a few unique species that have rod-shaped bones in their fins. And so those are the distinguishing factors between these groups, or at least the main distinguishing factor. And so you'll want to understand that. And so to better understand these groups, let's take a look at some examples of each. And the Conrichthians, they are made up of sharks, rays, and skates. The skates are similar to uh, rays, except they have some few anatomical and behavioral um, differences. But they all have a flexible skeleton made out of cartilage. Um, in this group, they have something called a lateral line system that helps with uh, detection, uh, movement of other animals, and um, uh, like sense detection. And it spans uh, along uh, from head to tail, 
along the sides, like the left and right sides of the body. Uh, some in this group are suspension feeders, while others are adept predators. Um, sensing blood from miles away is what the shark is known for. Um, most of the group, the animals in this group, have to keep swimming in order to put, uh, keep, have, have a nice flow of water going over the gills at all times. And so this uh, is obviously for uh, respiration. They need to always be respiring, so they always need to be swimming. All right, so looking at the rayfin fishes here, most of the fish you're familiar with will be in this group. Uh, there's a lot of commercially valuable fish um, in this group, so mo uh, they have a skeleton made of bones, what qualifies them uh, to be a rayfin fish. Uh, some of them will have an um, operculum, which allows fish to breathe without the constant need to swim. Um, it's a protective covering over the gills that allows for a constant um, amount of water rushing over it without the fish having to swim for that uh, water flow. And some of them will have a swim bladder. Uh, this is almost like a a balloon and like an internal balloon for fish that keeps them buoyant and so they can, tr can control um, of which the level of they are in the environment that they're in so they can be towards the uh, closer towards the top of the water uh, or deeper in the water and so here you can see some examples of balloon fish a seahorse and flounder um, but pretty much all the fish you're familiar with salmon cod tuna um, all of them will be in this group. Here you can see um, the, a diagram of a fish and an example of a rainbow trout. Um, but within that fish, you can see its bony skeleton, its swim bladder, um, well, that allows it to maintain its own buoyancy, a bunch of different uh, fins, and then the gills with an operculum covering on top. Um, so those are some traits of the fish in the raisin fish group. And then lastly, the lobe fin fish. Uh, here you can see an example of a lung fish. But another um, fish in this group is the coelacanth. Um, they are unique in that they were once thought to be extinct, but they've been, they've been found in, I believe, 1937 off the coast of um, either Africa or Asia, I can't quite remember, <laughs> uh, but they are a very unique fish. Um, and if you have ever played that game, Animal Crossing, it's a very popular one, apparently. Um, and so uh, you can see its name comes from part of which is, it has a cavity, um, the sela, seal part, the what we saw last time, the selum, uh, sela camp. But uh, both of these fish have very large pectoral and pelvic fins that you can see there, and that's caused by their rod-shaped bones. And so that's the unifying trait. Um, and so this, these next two slides uh, help connect how the evolution occurred from these um, fishes to eventually vertebrates that lived on land. Um, and so this is very important in terms of evolutionary history, uh, but I, I usually don't like to focus on this, and so this is not something that you'll want to uh, look at in terms of testing. Um, but here it shows you how they've connected lung fishes from the Devonian period to amphibians and amniotes from the carnivorous period. And so um, through the studies, they found um, some, if not several, uh, fossil remains of these uh, in-between species here. So Artis uh, has di er, depicted one of those in this picture here. And so moving right along to amphibians. Uh, amphibians uh, include salamanders, frogs, and sicilians. Uh, so notice here, no lizards or snakes. Uh, we'll see those in the reptile part. And so amphibians are united by the fact that they, use, they have a moist skin and that helps with um, gas exchange. 
And so they'll actually um, have, have respiration through not only their small lungs, but also their skin. And so that's why it needs to stay moist. <clears throat> um, some will have poison glands in their skins as well for protection. Uh, amphibians are known for laying their eggs in water and then undergoing a metamorphosis uh, from a larval stage to an adult form. Um, and so that's a complete metamorphosis uh, going from a larva that's aquatic, usually to an adult that lives on land. And so that makes them the first tetrapods to colonize land. And so we have some examples here. Uh, so salamander uh, is known for its long tail, four legs, having a, a, a moist skin, being in damp environments, and having uh, what we saw in the earlier chapter in evolution, uh, the pedomorphosis, where they're um, sexual development is slow compared to their structural development or their like body development. And so they look like an adult, or sorry, they function as an adult being able to sexually reproduce, but they still look like a juvenile. Um, and so that's um, kind of what uh, the salamander group consists of. Then you have the frogs that are in, in here. Uh, so frogs have the same features, starting out aquatic with eggs um, in the water, then the transformation from the larva to the adult, um, and then living on land. Uh, so the toads are part of the frog group, but they have are classified as having a leathery skin. And then looking at the bottom here, the Sicilian is probably the most unfamiliar amphibian and that it has lost its legs during evolution. It is known for um, burrowing under, uh, underground, and so it does not need its legs to do so. And so uh, for amphibians, want to know which ones are amphibians, salamanders, frogs, Sicilians, um, and then the two traits here using their moist skin, and then undergoing metamorphosis are things to focus on. Um, and so our question here asks us, in what ways are amphibians not completely adapted for terrestrial life? Uh, well, looking at their beginning stages, their eggs are not um, protected against terrestrial life, so they need to be in that aquatic form to survive. Uh, so along with some of their larval stages or transitional stages, um, they do uh, need that water uh, to survive. And they even as an adult, their skin isn't waterproof and um, must stay moist to prevent uh, to permit gas exchange. Then we ride along to reptiles here. Uh, so reptiles, um, and mammals together um, are amniotes. We'll see as mammals branch off, they will lose that amniotic feature, um, or at least it changes so it doesn't look the same. Um, but inside reptiles, uh, birds are found. And so that will be one of the things we'll see in this uh, reptile group. But first, looking at the egg, uh, so the amniotic egg has four membranes, and these membranes all have different functions that help um, in terms of survival for the embryo. Um, so for the first, the first membrane is an amnion that surrounds the embryo, so fluid fill sac just for protection. Uh, the yolk sac will have the nutrients for the embryo. The other two fluid uh, membranes are the um, core, core ion or allantoy, uh, they help with the gas exchange, so oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then the allantoy is the fourth one, and that helps with waste. And so those are shown here. And that you have the shell, a protective covering, the albumin, um, which is uh, known for being a protein inside eggs. Uh, so that layer 
then you have your amnion, uh, which is a blue cavity sur directly surrounding the embryo. Uh, then you have the yolk sac in yellow there, and then the corion and allantoid are fairly close together um, towards the right side there. Uh, these, while very important, are, are not features that I ask you to know. Um, and so here you can go ahead and just mark that off. Uh, but the, the overall characteristic of an amniotic egg is something you do want to know. So you don't necessarily need to know these here. So here's an example um, of eggs of um, a, a European grass snake laying eggs there. But reptiles themselves, they include lizards, snakes, turtles, crocodilians, um, birds, and extinct dinosaurs. <clears throat> and then, so they, as a group, they're known for having a skin with scales um, that's waterproofed with the protein keratin. Uh, they'll use their lungs to get, get their oxygen, um, and they're known for being ectothermic, which is something you'll want to understand and that they maintain their body heat by absorbing it from their environment rather than generating their own body heat. And so that you can see that in this picture here of a bearded dragon basking in the sun. Um, and so what happens there is usually um, at, in the morning, animals, once they awake from their sleep, are cool because, or colder in temperature uh, because uh, early mornings tend to be cooler than the daytime and so they'll go out into the sun to absorb some of that light and heat and so then they will now have warmer temperature and be able to go about doing its daily activities and so if they ever get overheated then they need to find some shade to cool down in all right, um, so within the reptiles, you have birds, and birds are very, very different than all the other reptile groups, as every aspect of their body went, underwent adaptations to um, help the, the ability to fly. And so they are going to um, actually be very, very different. They're not going to be ectothermic. They're going to be endothermic, thermic, and so they will use their um, body to generate heat and to um, keep um, a warm steady body temperature that way and so that is uh, something you'll want to be able to distinguish the difference between endothermic and ectothermic um, abilities so ectothermic relies on the environment to to get its heat um, for body heat and then endothermic will use metabolism, so breaking down molecules um, to uh, get a warm, steady body temperature. In terms of flight, um, they have many different features that allow for them to fly, such as um, feathers have hollow shafts, bones have a, a hollow-ish honeycomb structure, they have um, Find control of their muscles along with eyesight uh, to, to help fly well. Uh, so these things are very helpful for birds. And so uh, overall, um, understanding their flight features does help with learning uh, or understanding their ability for flight. And so looking at some examples here, we have a frigid bird on the bottom left and a albatross on the right. Um, and so some of you may, have, may be familiar with the phrase, um, having an albatross around one's neck. I was interested in the meaning of that. And so I sort of looked it up. And so I have a little sticky note that reminds me what, where it came from. Um, and that is from a poem written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, the poem is titled The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, um, where a sailor will uh, shoot a very friendly albatross 
and um, as punishment for killing said albatross, he has to wear its car carcass around his neck. Uh, so I found that to be pretty interesting. Um, side note here, and obviously nothing to study uh, in particular, but wearing an albatross around his neck has a new meaning for me now. Alrighty, in terms of evolution, uh, there's more information in our book about how uh, they have evolved from these small two-legged dinosaurs. But again, that's not something I want to focus on, so we'll kind of um, bypass these slides here. And move straight into mammals. Uh, mammals are known for being endothermic amniotes, so they're going to maintain their own body heat using different mechanisms, internal mechanisms, um, and those will vary by species and group, so um, that's not something we'll look detailed into. Um, and so one, one way they have uh, to maintain their body heat is through hair um, that will insulate the body, and then uh, another unifying feature is mammary glands that produce milk. And so to have this high rate of metabolism to maintain their own body heat, uh, they're going to have very efficient respiratory and circulatory systems, along with uh, a very um, vast amount of diets and uh, different teeth to accommodate those diets. And so in the mammal group, there are three uh, subgroups, the monotremes, marsupials and eutherians. And so we briefly talked about the marsupials and ether eutherians in the evolution chapters, uh, but here we'll take a little bit more of a look at them. In terms of um, mono monotremes, they are going to be our egg-laying mammals. Um, and so these egg-laying mammals uh, will depend on uh, the hatching of the eggs for their youth survival as compared to the other mammals. Um, the other mammals, their offspring will uh, be born rather than hatched. And so in these embryos, are going to have a placenta uh, structure that uh, will help the nutrients from the mother's blood diffuse directly into the embryo's blood. And so for marsupials, they're going to have a brief gestation period and then give birth to tiny offspring that are not um, developed as young yet completely. And so they're going to um, remain in a pouch of some sort uh, attached to the mother um, to complete development into the offspring before they are able to venture out on their own. Versus the Ethereans, they're going to um, they are fully developed live young that will be able to um, have its own abilities of life without being attached to the mother. And so here you can see some examples of the duck-billed platypus with newly hatched young um, there on the top left. Um, and so this particular example, they actually secrete milk through their skin, which is very different. And so the um, offspring there will then uh, just need to be near the mother, um, mother's skin to, to take in that milk. Then you have your marsupial in the bottom center image with a kangaroo. Uh, so there you can see the um, baby kangaroo is inside the pouch where it will complete its development, and then once it's ready, it will leave the pouch and be able to um, be part of that uh, kangaroo family. And then you have the Ethereans with the zebra on the top right. Uh, so at birth, they're completely ready, um, fully developed as an offspring in terms of um, it's going to be able to uh, move about normally it's going to be able to interact with its environment normally. It's just still going to depend on the mother for uh, nutrition, um, but it's going to be able to move along with the herd just fine.
Um, and so those, you'll want to know the three groups and then the differences um, there. So uh, in terms of uh, offspring production, egg laying, pouch formation here, or pouch development, and then fully developed in terms of offspring. So obviously they're not producing an adult, they're producing an offspring that's capable of uh, sustaining its own life to some extent. <laughs> All right, so that brings us to primate diversity. Uh, so looking at primates, we have several features that are shared. Um, and so these evolved about 65 million years ago. And so looking at their characters, they have limber joints like shoulder and arm joints are much more um, flexible in terms of movement than all the uh, mammals we saw already. Uh, they're going to have grasping hands and feet with flexible digits of fingers and toes. Uh, they're going to have a short snout um, for uh, olfactory receptors or you know, so sense of smell. And then forward pointing or forward facing eyes that help with depth perception. So seeing farther away and being able to tell what's farther away and what's closer up um, would be part of depth perception. And so looking at uh, primates, most of them are adapted to trees. Um, and so that's most living primates here are arboreal um, tree living, but humans, as we know, never lived in trees. And so we have several traits that have evolved from our primate ancestors. And so looking at primate diversity, uh, there, so here are the distinguish features of primates again for you. With a loris example and a lemur, uh, so these two are part of the group of primates that evolved first. And then for monkeys, we have um, a further division of old world versus new world monkeys, or old world being um, from Africa and Europe, new world being from the Americas or Central or uh, sorry, North, Central, and South America. And so you might be wondering, well, why is that important? What's the difference? Um, so here you can see there are several differences that enable different abilities for these monkeys, and that has a huge effect on their interaction with the environment. Uh, so the old world monkeys are mostly um, living in trees. Some will uh, dwell, uh, live on the ground. Uh, their nostrils open downward, and they have um, a tail, but it's not prehensile, so that it's not able to grasp onto things. And so they are mostly um, uh, adapted for living well in the trees, and they don't have competition in those trees. Um, and so here you can see an example of the lion-tailed maquis there. Whereas the New World monkeys, all of them live in the trees. Uh, their nostrils open to the side, they're farther apart. Uh, that is an evolutionary advantage uh, for easier breathing. And then they have a long prehensile grasping tail that helps with movement about those trees. And so it's assumed that they had more competition living in the higher um, tree region. And so they evolved those new functions. And so here you can see the golden lion tamarind example. And so um, you want to know that the main differences between the old world and the new world monkeys. Um, so the, the tree dwelling, uh, the tail, and the nostrils as well. Um, so all those things there. And then the last group are the apes. Uh, so the apes do not have a tail. Uh, their body size varies greatly. And they have very many um, like sub genus um, and species. And so some of them are shown here. Uh, they normally have larger brains and body size, uh, but their behaviors are much more flexible. Uh, here you can see the orangutan 
uh, was native to Sumatra, you know, where the um, carrion uh, rot, rotting flower lives, along with Borneo, a very shy group that lives uh, or that lives in groups. Uh, whereas the gibbon is more Southeast Asia, they are very flexible, um, most well adapted to living in trees. And so they are actually pretty small. Then the gorilla and its offspring there, it's a very, the largest of the apes, um, community dwelling, uh, ground dwelling, um, herbivores, uh, gorillas. Um, and so those are pretty well known, along with chimp chimpanzees. Another um, closely related group, the bonobos, look very similar to the chimpanzees. And so they're known for their intellectual socializing abilities. And then lastly, humans. Uh, humans are categories, categorized into the section with apes. Um, and so in terms of organization, primates are into three groups. Uh, the lemurs, lorises, and bush babies are the first group. So these are the smallest of apes. Um, and then the second group, tarsiers, they are um, pretty uh, similar in size to lemurs, lorises, and bush babies. But in terms of evidence, um, they're somewhere in between this group and the last group, which is the monkey and the ape group. And so that's the last one here. And so you can see that in this tree, um, that the first group is here, the second group is here, and then the third is the rest of it. And so the Tarsiers there themselves have um, its own distinct group as they have shared characteristics of the monkey, uh, the, the last group, um, the arthropoids, uh, which is monkeys and apes. And they also have some similar, some similarities to um, the first group, which lemurs, lorises, and bush babies. So you want to know the three groups um, here, uh, not necessarily um, much more information than what we've already gone over. So. That brings us to humans, or the um, hominin evolution, the evolution of uh, the species that led to uh, the homo sapien human that we're familiar with today. And so looking at uh, this type of study is called paleoanthropology. Uh, so paleo, um, study of fossils, fossils, anthro being humans, and then apology, study of uh, so the study of human origins and evolution is uh, how you would define it. And so it um, starts at where humans and chimpanzee lineages had a common ancestor and takes off from there. Um, and so that's the tiniest slice of ev evolutionary history in terms of lifetime, but overall it's still a very long span of time of hundreds of thousands of years. And so scientists in this area of study have found about 20 species of extinct hominins, uh, which are species more closely related to humans than to chimpanzees. And due to the fact that they are extinct, it would be too, uh, some, in some instances, it's too hard to discover which one is actually closest to. Um, and so some of these may have lived at the same time, others lived at different times. And so here in this next picture, Next page, we have a timeline for some hominin species. And so you can see in terms of million years ago, Homo sapiens are the most recent. And so that's us there. We'll also look at the Neanderthals, which is right below that there. Okay, so based on the fossil evidence represented in this figure, how many hominin species existed 1.7 million years ago. So reading this um, chart, you would want to look at the green line. And so anywhere from you know, this 1.5 region to 2.0, you look and you can see this one here. Uh, so the Boise, the Robustus here, 
uh, Urgenster here. Oh, uh, Habilis, Urgenster, and then lastly, uh, the Erectus group. Um, and so that's how you would answer that question. And so looking at humans and chimpanzees, we clearly differ in a lot of features, but there are two major ones. Humans are bipedal, so we walk on two legs, not four, and we have much larger brains. Um, and so those are the two features you want to understand um, in terms of differences between chimpanzees and humans. And also another thing you want to understand is uh, the question became, which one arose first? Uh, did we start walking upright first or did we develop larger brains first? And so due to evidence that has been found, um, the bipedalism or walking upright arose before larger brain size. And so that's something also you'll want to know. Um, that we start, humans started walking on two feet first and then developed a larger brain. Um, and so as we uh, evolved, we became more and more different than the chimpanzee group. And so uh, the clue to bipedalism is the location of uh, where the spinal cord connects to the skull at the base. And so we'll see an image of that here. But first, um, an example of evidence in bipedalism from the early hominin group of footprints in ancient volcanic ash that was unearthed. And now the um, evidence with the spinal cord, you can see the spinal cord of the chimpanzees kind of goes out horizontally or laterally from the base of the skull, whereas ours moves more downward um, from the base of the skull. And so how can paleoanthropologists conclude that a species was bipedal based on only a fossil skull? And, by the, and so you look for that opening where the spinal cord would connect to the skull and see um, how, in terms of orientation, was it was that opening more uh, in terms of lateral um, direction or downward direction that would leave that spinal cord. Okay. And so that brings us to the um, next part of the chapter. They look at how larger brains evolve in different um hominin species, and so this, I mean, is very interesting here, but it's not something I ask you to really study, and as this chapter is large enough, and so we will um, go ahead and skip this part here. But we can take a, uh, a brief look at it in terms of this graph uh, that the Neanderthal group has a larger brain volume, at, so it's the highest level here. Um, in but its mean body mass is also bigger. So overall, they just were a lot larger, or by comparison, they were larger than the other groups. Uh, and they are Homo sapien um, <clears throat> group. We have a, a mean body mass of 100 kilograms with a volume mean of 1,300 cubic centimeters of brain. Um, so it's pretty high compared to the rest of them, but not as high as in the near thrall group there. Oh, and I'm sorry, the picture is misleading. It's actually this bullet point. So it's mean volume mass of 60 versus 1300. All right. Um, so looking at larger brains in the Neanderthal um, hominin species, uh, so they had a brain that was larger than ours, and from evidence, uh, we can tell they hunted large uh, game, so large ant mammals, um, with tools made from stone and wood. So they're um, pretty well, developmentally speaking, in terms of um, a ability to capture um, predators uh, and attain them as food much larger than themselves. Based on evidence, they were living in Europe as long as 350,000 years ago, um, spread to the Near East, but about 39,000 years ago, they became extinct. And so that can be 
uh, regions uh, where they live can be seen here in this area. And so in terms of uh, what to understand about Neanderthals is that they had a larger brain, uh, they're extinct now, and so um, you may ask, well, were they ancestors or uh, uh, did they lead to the development of Homo sapiens? And the answer to that question is uh, no. They have common ancestors with Homo sapiens, um, but they had, and so the reason why we know that is because they had interbreeding at one point. Um, the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens had some interbreeding um, in the European region. Um, and so to this day, it left Europeans and Asians with roughly 3% up to 3% Neanderthal genome in their DNA. And so um, we can see that they shared some DNA at some point. So they intermingled, existed, or first existed at the same time, and then interbred at one point and had offspring that survived. And so uh, the obviously the Homo sapien offspring um, that were predominantly Homo sapiens survived. And so overall, um, Neanderthals are larger, larger brains. Um, they have, they are extinct today, and they had interactions with Homo sapiens. Are the things to understand? <laughs> and so, looking at um, fossils, DNA evidence, we're able to trace early human history to originate um, on the species Homo sapien in Africa with um, fossils that were discovered in Ethiopia and are as old as anywhere between 195,000 to um, 160,000 years old. And so here you can see about a 30,000 year old um, artwork in a cave in France. And so this next um, section looks at the history of hominins and questions about uh, different species, uh, but we won't really take a look at that here as it's um, interesting, but not something I want to focus on. And so looking at um, human evolution, there are many aspects you could diverge into, but one of which we'll take a look at is human skin color. Um, and it seems to reflect, have a trend based on uh, the environment of which that group of um, ho uh, Homo sapiens lived in predominantly. And so it's uh, probably due to um, natural selection. And so that's matching um, their environment better. And so to understand why that might occur, you, you want to understand some properties of how the sun affects uh, humans in terms of their skin. Uh, there's a, a, a good level of which humans need the sun um, in, in terms for their skin. And so if they get too much uh, UV radiation, that will degrade something called folate, which is essential for development. And so uh, they need but they do need some UV radiation to help make vitamin D, uh, which is for proper bone development. And so you'll, you'll want to understand you need some, but not too much sun. And so when you get too much, you degrade full weight. And if you don't get enough, you don't make enough vitamin D. Um, and so full weight is um, vital for fetal development. So many women take it during pregnancy. Uh, it's also important for sp um, spermatogenesis. And so here you can see um, an example of a variety of skin colors. And so the skin colors will actually have been found um, in terms of natural selection to uh, correspond geographically. 
And so the area of the tropical latitudes near the equator get so much sun that they um, need a way to protect from degrading that folate. And so when they get too much sun, they're going to um, need to find that way to protect against the degradation. And so they will actually have the darker skin color that will help protect against that um, so that pigment um, melanin is going to help um, uh, take away the adverse effect on getting too much sun. Whereas the um, people in the regions that are above or below that uh, tropical latitude region, they're going to have a risk of not getting enough sun and um, have a vitamin D deficiency. And so their skin tone is usually lighter to try to absorb as much sun as they possibly can. And so you can think the areas in yellow here need sun and the area here in orange has too much sun. And so that's why their skin um, has evolved to have darker um, pigmentation so it resists uh, the breakdown of that fault weight that um, is needed. All right, um, so our last kind of concept here is that um, our knowledge of everything we've discussed is far from complete. Uh, thousands of species are be being discovered each year and that um, these discoveries are increasing um, yearly due to better access to remote era areas of the earth and new mapping technologies. Um, and so just keep that in mind that our um, knowledge is far from complete. Um, it's, uh, it's always changing and things are always being added. And when new things get added, usually that means our phylogenetic trees, our evolutionary history um, concepts can change. And so here we can see some examples of some unique uh, newly discovered organisms. Uh, here is a psychedelic frogfish um, discovered in, in Indonesia. Here is a Lysula and new monkey species in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then lastly here, you can see this uh, nice frog um, with a checkpoint question asking us which factors are responsible for a recent increase in the number of new species found. So essentially, um, new, newer technology allows us to um, go to remote areas and newer regions um, and look into uh, new organisms and new environments. And so that's uh, what allows us to discover new species. And so that brings us to the end of the chapter with your now should be able to use. Um, and then additional slides that might help in terms of or overall organization, understanding this chapter here. And so um, I will um, post those videos of the hagfish and the lamprey in the comments for you to take a look at. Um, please do, they're really short and they're really fun to watch. So um, until next time, bye-bye for now.